Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Andrea Mosley, and I will be moder moder I can't talk, moderating the conversation today. So I would really like to um, introduce our fantastic panel who will be taking us through the Reimagining Not-for-Profits webinar today. Um, if I could ask you all to introduce yourself, uh, Clemsy, I will start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, good uh, morning, depending on which part of the globe you are. I, my name is Clancy Apavu. I'm the senior partner of HLB Mauritius, uh, which is the member firm of HLB Global in the small island of Mauritius. For those who don't know where Mauritius is situated, it is a small island between India and Eastern Africa, a small stone thrown in the Indian Ocean. Apart from being involved in, I'm also the global leader for HLB Network uh, well, uh, worldwide. Uh, apart from my involvement in audit, taxation, and advisory, I have been leading not for profit consultancy for a number of years for NGOs, associations, and also for funders like the, the World Bank, the UNDP in particular, and other private donors. Within HLB, as a worldwide network, we are firm proponents of not for profit sector. And uh, also, we are we support fully the seven, uh, what we call the sustainable uh, development goals of the adopted by the nation, national, the United Nations in 2015. And uh, I'm very pleased to participate in this webinar, and I look forward to share my experience with you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Clancy. Um, Eddie, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. My name is Eddie Kua. I am a partner of HLB Sustain CSR, a member firm based in Malta, providing advisory services on sustainability and corporate social responsibility. I have over 30 years of work experience in IT and finance, and have lived and worked in Asia, Australasia, and in the UK. I've also served on the board for UK charity, and is very much now into helping businesses understand sustainability and corporate social responsibility, and what we could do to lay the foundation for a greener, sustainable future. It is indeed a pleasure to be here and to be able to share a seat with my distinguished panel members, Clancy, Israel, and Karen. Great, thank you, Eddie. To you. Israel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Israel Tannenbaum, um, and I work with Smith & Brown. I'm a partner in the National Tax Service Group um, through HLB USA, um, and really do spend my time focusing on our not-for-profit clients. Um, I've really spent my career um, over the past 20 years in the not-for-profit sector, uh, in the public accounting space, really um, at Big Four and other uh, global accounting organizations, and really, have spent my career, as I said, in the not-for-profit sector. Um, it's something that I take very much an interest in and I think is very important um, and really enjoy supporting global nonprofits and seeing the great work they do. So I'm excited to be here with everyone to talk about um, where we're at now, how we've adapted over the course of the last year and how not-for-profits can transform to move forward successfully. Great, thank you. And lastly, Karen? Hi, good day, everybody. My name is Karen Robinson. I am the CFO and Executive Vice President of Global Impact. Global Impact is a charity that supports uh, the broader philanthropic sector, whether it's uh, nonprofits, corporates, uh, or individuals in uh, providing them support that they need to implement their, their charitable visions. Uh, and they are also the owner of Geneva Global, uh, which is a B corporation. So my experience is fairly broad in the sector between for-profits, B corporations, nonprofits, supporting foundations, individuals, and, and other nonprofits with um, implementing their, their needs uh, around the world. Great, thank you all. So for any questions that the audience may have, um, I would ask you to please use the Q&A box, um, which is on the right hand side to ask the panel um, any questions. Um, and we will discuss those uh, towards the end of the, today's webinar. So during um, the conversation today, we'll be discussing how not-for-profits needs have changed in the last year, um, where we are now, um, and how they can build back better as we kind of approach the business as usual or the new normal as we're, as we're calling it. 
So moving straight ahead, um, we know that COVID-19 um, brought no end of economic upheaval to uh, industries across the globe um, and not-for-profits were not immune from this. So how did they, um, in order to give, give us some context into rebuilding back better, we want to understand how they've adapted to the past year. So, um, Clinzy, if I can start with you, how do you, how, from your experience, how have not-for-profits um, been dealing with the, the challenges of, of the last 12 months? Oh, I think that the, the pandemic has created a monster we free head all around the world. We've got health challenges, we've got social challenges, and economic challenges. So no country has been spared with that, and no business, no type of association, whether it is business or not for profit, they have all gone through the wave. Uh, funding, I think, uh, before we talk about other ways of looking at it, funding is felt to be a major issue all around the world. Uh, world economy has undergone severe contraction. We know that whether it is government funding, whether it is funding by enterprises and corporate or donors, there had been a big hit on finance, and this day a big hit also on the finance, on the financing of NFPs. Uh, business enterprises, NFPs are faced uh, with the challenges of re reinventing themselves as all other businesses, as all other enterprises. Everybody has to look inside the enterprise. They review their reverse model in order to find ways of working through. In, again, as a matter of introduction, I'd like to say that whether in this aftermath, it is not yet aftermath, we were within the pandemic, right? Some countries are in the third wave, others in the first wave, right? Most of them are in the second wave, actually. I do think that businesses realize whether it is a business for profit or business not for profit, there are three, a combination of three main capital or three main systems which exist in order to make it happen. We've got the technical system in which we are going to see the business model. We will show processes. We will see capacity building, innovation, the capacity to innovate. I think it also applies to uh, non-for-profit non, non businesses. And so this first capital, this technical capital, has definitely been affected. Mm -hmm. The second capital is the social capital, where we find the people factor, where we need talents in order to, re to jump again, in order to reinvent ourselves. The capacity to network and to build up, most important in the, in the case of uh, non-for-profit businesses, and also communication, to let know what we are doing, how we have suffered, and how we wish to get back. The third capital, the third economic capital, is the economic capital. So finance is important. And as I've said to begin with, finance, everybody is in the, on the same wave, right? Everybody has been hit. So finance is an important issue. The, the, the importance of capital raising, the importance of budgeting, the importance of financial reporting. Uh, in Mauritius, very quickly, we had, a, we had a, a, just after the first wave, which ended for us in June last year, we had the misfortune of having a, 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 a ship which had a wreck on the reef of Mauritius. You know, Mauritius is a small tourist island. Mm. We had a wreck by a, by a Japanese ship called Wakashio. And you know, when, it is, when there is a crisis that all stakeholders realize the importance of NGOs, the importance of not-for-profit business. It happened and we leave it, right? We leave it in June this year, last year, when this happened, there was a lot of oil spilled on our, in our reef, in our lagoon. And the whole of Mauritius, we are a small population of 1.3 million people. But the whole of Mauritius realized the importance of NGOs, the importance of not-for-profit businesses. And it was not a question of health. It was not a question of economy or finance. It was a question of putting hands together. So that was a big, big, big evidence of the importance that and NFPs, right, can play in any place. And we have lived that and we consider, right, today that more than ever, right, not-for-profit businesses has got their place. They are very important for the society. And with this wave that we are happening, we, which is happening, right, we do feel that its importance is more than, 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 than ever before. So we are going to analyze more as we go forward, right, what has happened, and where we wish to go, right? So that is my first contribution on that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Clinzy. Um, Israel, if I can ask you how, what from a 
client um, perspective have you been seeing about the challenges the not-for-profits have faced in the last year? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and it's it's interesting because, um, you know, obviously over the past year, nonprofits are seeing donations drop to some extent, um, certain doors that were open to them being closed, both literally and figuratively, um, and really the reserves dwindle down as they try to support their legacy programs while facing all these different challenges. Um, however, you know, it's not the first time we've seen recessions, other natural disasters, um, other global events that do come out and challenge the status quo for not-for-profit organizations and really drive them to reevaluate and at times reinvent themselves. Um, and it can really be an opportunity to reimagine who you are as an organization, what you do, um, and to ultimately make your organization better in the process. So this is something that I've seen a lot of not-for-profit organizations um, step forward to take this challenge um, and to really see where they're at and how they can go forward um, better and stronger than ever. For example, I've um, been working with an organization that provides mental health counseling services. And obviously throughout the pandemic that had been affected, all their services to that point had really been in person. Um, the pandemic forced them to shift to a virtual therapy model. Um, and they've actually found that to be so effective at serving their constituents um, that they're going to be, as well as actually being able to expand their reach, both nationally and globally, since you can deliver virtual services, you don't have that constraint of having to be there in person, um, that they're actually going to incorporate this model into their go forward, um, into their go forward model for providing their services. So we can see that really adapting and changing times can bring opportunities to make improvements and develop these strategies that ultimately ensure long-term sustainability for the organization. Um, of course, throughout history, we, as I said, we have faced these different types of economic environments and uncertainty. Um, and one thing I do think that differs today from the past is in terms of the tools we have on hand to address this um, with technology, digital platforms, other sustainable practices. These are giving organizations the tools they need to actually meet these challenges and hopefully come back stronger and more impactful um, on a go forward basis. Great. Um, picking up on um, Israel's points about sustainability, Eddie, how, how have you seen um, not-for-profits reacting to to the last 12 months yeah it's, it's interesting you asking that question but before i go into that i would like to say the past year has been challenging for all i mean businesses and not for profits the whole world has changed we have the climate emergency with the effects of climate change impacting on people's life climate refugees are on the increase with rising sea level and the pandemic itself has resulted in many companies closing jobs loss, mental health issues increasing and so on and all these consequences basically means that there's less income that's out there to be contributing uh, contributed to charities and so on so i expect and in fact i've observed that over the last 12 months there's less income circulating from the angle of going into fundraising right so without doubt directors management of charities have been busy understanding and challenging their organizations to think outside the box in terms of their operating model and their financial sustainability. And for many non-for-profits, donor relations are vital during these trying times as well. Clear lines of communication with donors are becoming crucial in keeping them engaged. And many are actually reviewing their allocation of funds to assess how the funds are utilized. I know of some not for profits having to dip into their reserves to just keep themselves going especially when they have been so reliant on face-to-face -face fundraising which had dried up on many fronts thank goodness there's some governments who are still giving grants but we anticipate that this will drop eventually as well on another aspect of things is not for profits etc often relies on volunteers and volunteers are under no obligation obligation to continue to volunteer if they do not feel comfortable to do so during the pandemic. Hence, this poses issues for many. And if we look at it, organizations, I believe organizations which can embrace the change, can adapt, can reinvent, they will start to see new opportunities opening up 
to become more resilient and sustainable for the future. So think about going into a space of sustainability, about climate, etc., and how you can actually match things with your charity to become more visible to the new generation of supporters out there. And that's, that's what I felt in terms of the past challenge and how we might be able to look forward. Yeah. And Karen, coming to you from a uh, client perspective, how, how has Global Impact um, you know, coped over the last 12 months and just the industry in general? I, I like to focus on the silver lining of what the pandemic uh, and the economic and uh, social issues have taught all of us over the past few months. And so from a, a positive perspective, I think A, it's made us all get a lot better at our communications and being very deliberate and intentional and in how often uh, that we communicate within our organization and outside of our organization. I've seen a lot of benefits for us in, in making those moves. I've also noticed we've seen in general with our clients on the fundraising front, those that have embraced the virtual fundraising activities and been able to have salons or have events uh, in order to continue providing fundraising in their organization and bring a COVID lens to their work. So talk specifically how their work is impactful and important uh, throughout the pandemic, they've been they've been successful and they've continued to generate funds. They've also brought in new donors. So millennials and Gen Z seem more interested in engaging from this medium. So that's also been a great learning and uh, an upside, I think, for for our uh, organization and our our clients during this time period. And then the other thing that we've seen is an increase in interest in pooled funds. So when we start to talk about communities and communities working together, I think this has also been a great time for nonprofits themselves to pick their heads up and think and look more broadly uh, across their, their organization and their, their stakeholders and, and think more broadly about working together with more, with more people to really be impactful in the future. Great. So, I mean, we've touched on it a little. Um, we're obviously now in the new normal. I mean, what that looks like is varying across across the globe. As Cleansy pointed out, some um, countries are back in going back into lockdowns. Others are, you know, uh, you know, they're 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 moving ahead and their 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 countries are fine. But um, as we slowly kind of move closer to what everyone might hope is business as usual, um, not for profits are obviously facing. Um, the same challenges of um, how, how do they adapt to this this new model? Um, what um, Karen, you you kind of touched on the 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 ad adaptations that that um, not for profits are have have made. Is there any other um, you know kind of just where are we now? Are there any other other aspects of of the new normal that they're they're doing? Well, I think certainly in the service delivery uh, piece for all nonprofits, there's, um, as I, I think um, Eddie and Clenzie both um, mentioned within the mental health space or having volunteers, uh, organizations have had to pivot in their service delivery. So, for example, we have an out of school children program uh, running in Ethiopia that was class classroom based. And we had mm -hmm. to quickly change that delivery into micro classes so that mm -hmm. we could still provide the students with ongoing learning, come up with some additional uh, individual curriculum so that they could do work from home on their own um, while still being able to get the, uh, the children learning at a, at a level and get them back into public school at some point. So I would expect most organizations have similar stories on their programmatic side and changes that they've had had to make. But I think that will also influence it, all future programming. So when you can look and see that you can deliver um, programmatic services in a combined manner, that also probably helps you with your financial and economic model that you need for your programs at the same time. Penzi, what are your, your thoughts? How are, um, where are we now kind of in this new normal? I think uh, there is a new, uh, all businesses and organizations have to adopt a new paradigm now because things have completely changed. Mm -hmm. Things are different. 
I had the opportunity at start of this year, just, uh, you know, we went into a, a first wave and then uh, this year we are in the second wave, actually. We are in confinement, actually, in Mauritius. And earlier this, this year, I had the opportunity to talk a bit to some NGOs who have been affected and, who, of course, who could not find enough finance uh, issues and so on. And we had some reflection that finance is not the only issue that is here. So the new normal is we have to think out of the box. My friend Eddie just mentioned that. And we should not look at finance as the only issue for us to move forward. We may not have finance, but there is a lot of things that now today people recognize in NGOs and NFPs and that we can bring to society. So I had a few workshops with people just to, to understand what are, how are they dealing with the new normal, with a new challenge. And people are conscious of the fact that there is a paradigm shift in terms of what they do. People now are thinking that they have to look at their budgets, right? They have to, they, they, there is a pressure for a strategic solutions which they can bring in different areas where they are operating. And also that they, they should also look at, the, at, the, at their business, at their organization from a business point of view. Look at the bottom line, what is happening. Because very often we look at the social aspect, as I'm saying earlier, there are always these three mechanics, these three metrics, which have to be put together. Right, the technical aspect, the economic aspect, and the social aspect. I think that this new paradigm now require NGOs to put them together. And I've seen that this consciousness is already there. And I think this is the way forward. Yeah, Israel, what are your thoughts? It's interesting, you know, I, I think um, in the last year, obviously, and everyone's made this point great, there's been such a massive shift and the old structure that maybe in some ways we were used to um, with divergent nonprofit, corporate government sectors seems to really have gone out the window at this point. And instead there's this um, complex, almost competitive marketplace um, that really doesn't reflect what was probably the original intention of the nonprofit sector's role as sort of a safe non-business opportunity for charitable causes. Um, to Cleansy's point, and you know, financing is just more diverse, it's complex um, to manage in general, to manage funding and staffing. Um, I believe Karen made the point earlier, it's, it, although it's multi-generational, millennials are really the ones that are becoming the majority at this point and are having a significant impact on organizational culture in general. Um, so what we're seeing is that in a way the nonprofit sector was already going through a state of change to some degree even prior to the pandemic. Um, and I, from what I've seen from many organizations, that's actually helped them in many ways respond and adapt to the challenges of the past year. Um, the other really important thing I think that has helped organizations is that to, to Karen's point, looking at the silver lining a little bit, there is some upside because in times of crisis and global pandemic certainly qualifies as that, this attracts much needed attention to the not-for-profit industry and what they do on a global basis in terms of providing support and resources um, at, at a time when it's really needed throughout the world and really coming to the forefront to help solve issues. Um, and what we've seen, at least in the short term for many organizations is that they've implemented short term strategies that may not, it, they may actually be mission related, they may be a little divergent from their mission. Um, but this has allowed them to continue to make an impact in the short term to these really global crisis issues while at the same time adapting to make sure that they can ses successfully do so in the future and continue to address maybe their original mission, but also provide support where it's most needed. Um, so we've definitely seen a lot of that shift over the past year. Yeah, Eddie, any final final thoughts on how, yeah, yeah. how they've adapted? Yeah, I think my panel members have touched a lot on it. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to recap, the situation over the past year has really push and accelerated the change, it got leadership in not-for-profit not to start thinking out of the box, not just in terms of their financial sustainability, but about their operating model itself as well, like the, how they operate internally, how the team meets, the board meetings, AGMs, everything has changed. Remote flex and flexible working are becoming a norm. And the interaction with donors and contributors, et cetera, 
they are all more careful about where their funds are going. So relationships, communications are very important now to give them the necessary assurance that their money is well spent and it will impact positively on all the beneficiaries. And I think that piece of communication and how you operate in this new model is very important because it sets the foundation to build trust, get respect and get people to support your cause. Yeah, really. agree, yes. And um, kind of ha talking just on on that and then re like we've, we've all touched on how you've reimagined your your not-for-profit um, and you've all mentioned that during the pandemic this you know it forced organizations to think more creatively about new ways to engage and serve you know serve their constituents serve the serve the publics um, how would you how would you kind of you know advise a not-for-profit now um, to you know, consider that, that how the needs have changed and now use this as an opportunity to rebuild. What what are the things that um, need to be kind of put in place for, for not-for-profits um, moving forward? Um, Israel, I'll start with you. Absolutely. So the thing I always think about um, is that non-for-profits exist to have an impact. And when a major shift such as the pandemic causes an organization's programs to become less impactful, which can happen because they either can't be delivered as effectively, um, or at in some points, it may become, they just may become less relevant um, because other, for example, pandemic related issues take prevalence um, over what their mission may be. Or we've actually seen some organizations that have had a shift and find new ways to be impactful, um, which is, I think, something everyone kind of touched on. And while in some cases this can be a temporary shift, organizations really need to take a step back and analyze what they've learned from that and how they can adapt to move forward successfully. Um, thinking about things such as look at the, you know, if they have a temporary program, um, or a new delivery method, Does is this something that could show promise for the future? Um, can it contribute to the organization's overall impact? Um, a good example I've seen of this is a nonprofit, which actually, um, very similar to what Karen was saying earlier, they focused on providing um, educational opportunities in underserved areas globally. Um, and one of the challenges that they did face, obviously, was similar. They can't deliver these services um, in person anymore, and they had to switch mm -hmm. to a vir to a uh, virtual format. And it was, as actually a result of this, um, they have changed their mission. I shouldn't say changed; they adapted their mission um, to include pushing for broadband in underserved areas as well, so that they can mm -hmm. actually move to that virtual format, um, which was a challenge to them as well, because many areas don't have that accessibility um, in terms of being able to have that <clears throat> to have that broadband or cellular access. So in a way, they did come up with a temporary, um, a, so to speak, temporary mission, um, but it is something that they're adapting in and does support their overall original mission. So it's about finding creative ways that can both enhance the overall mission of your organization while at the same time addressing the needs that are on the ground and at the forefront um, right now in the world. Um, and so that's something that we've seen many organizations um, focus on. It's to, to you know, kind of just bring it back. It's all about really being impactful and making that impact. And while the environment does change, that's a time when organizations can really take a look at themselves and say, um, where am I now? What are my missions accomplishing? Are they really being impactful? Is there a better way? Is there a different way to do things? Um, and through reimagining that, we've seen many organizations similar to my example earlier, just be able to come back stronger and incorporate both their original mission, but build on that um, and be successful on a global level. Great. Um, Clancy, what are your, your thoughts on reimagining? Fully, fully agree with Izzy, huh? though, because I think uh, it is a question of thinking out of the box. And uh, Izzy has just put it up. Huh? We should not, I think organizations should not concentrate on the long-term perspective. Today, they have to see what is the short term. So there's a, a mission, but, but they have to think out of the box and to see what are the strategies in order what that can be put in place in the very short term in order to, to see, to, to show, uh, to show to donors, to show to their stakeholders how they are, they are dealing with the impact. Mm -hmm. So what Izzy has said, it is a very broad brush about uh, the new strategies coming through. I agree fully with that. 
Karen, how have you um, reimagined uh, global impacts or how, how has the organization changed? Well, one of the things that we have seen happen, which has been super exciting, is that a number of donors have released grant restrictions. So music to anybody's ears about delivering impact and looking at the organizations you're funding and how you support them best as a donor right now. We found that um, with a number of different projects around the world has allowed the organizations that are being funded to flex and deal with their individual situation. And that's something mm -hmm. that I think would be really helpful in the future for all donors to rethink their investments and their funding streams and recognize that uh, organizations need to be able to flex whether it's a pandemic or another situation in the context of, of what they're dealing with. So that's something I, I think I would love to see continue. And I, I am sure uh, numerous other nonprofits around the world would uh, second that very quickly. Uh, and, and then the other thing that I think is important for us to try to build further conversations around, and, and all of the panelists are bringing up the idea of complexity that's developed for nonprofit sector with just the pandemic, the economic and the, the social issues that we're all dealing with. And I, I would like this to build an opportunity to get more um, support from our boards and encourage our boards to become more involved uh, with their resources and their time uh, to help it with the nonprofit organizations because most of our, our nonprofits do not have unlimited resources at their disposal to really understand all the complexities or understand how to work through uh, all of these issues that are, are facing them at the same time. And I think there's a, a really important opportunity for, for board members to step in and provide that support. That goes to your point, Eddie, about leadership and um, stepping up as it as it were yeah yeah definitely things have changed eh? when we talk about reimagining the new new strategy vision and mission representing hlb advisory services on sustainability and corporate social responsibility my mind often wanders into thinking about environment about social about governance matters when i think about that and i think for the not-for-profit sector itself it is no different if you start thinking about going green, it could be a good strategy as well, because going green is getting very popular, gets, getting traction out there. And green business practices, may, I mean, basically it will open up new market of environment lovers. And also that opens up new supporters. You will also enjoy a favorable, favorable public sentiment out there and also supportive government policies may come in to help your charity and your NFPs grow more. So I think charities and not-for-profits may, may want to think about incorporating some of these elements as they start to evolve, as they start to imagine how their future is going to be like. That's a good um, stepping stone to the next section to kind of focus in on, um, and that's people. Um, uh, you know, Eddie, you just talked about um, board members and leaders coming together, but um, the the talent aspect of um, a non for profit and how that will need to be reimagined is is going to be crucial for them to to thrive in um, over the next you know twelve mm. uh, next uh, next you know next few years. Um, where do you see the kind of um, people aspect coming into reimagining a not for profit? Yeah, as mentioned earlier on, we are all starting to live in a virtual world now. In a recent survey I came across, it was mentioned that 76% of respondents in the NFPs actually signal that their organization is not highly skilled yet to deal with the changes in the industry. And about 50% only felt that the digital capabilities of trustees are of the vision level, which means that there's opportunity, there's opportunity to actually start to invest in talent, in people, move into this space in a much stronger way. I mean, together with IT literacy, interpersonal communication skills, all these are becoming relevant and important. We have less face-to-face -face meetings for fundraising. 
we need to ask ourselves, is there proper governance from the trustees and are there values and channels of communications that could strengthen the relationship between stakeholders, i.e. the trustees, the management, the employees, the community, the suppliers and donors? Are there clear lines of focused communication as a child that goes, uh, goes through? The other aspect to think about when you talk about people is reflect on how diverse and inclusive your organization and the board are. Mm. Are there gender equality? Are there minority representation? Would the incorporation of diversity and inclusion actually connect the organization to a wider diverse range of supporters and beneficiaries, while at the same time provide a diversity of talents and thoughts in your operation and in a new model? It's something to think about, and I would support moving into this space. Absolutely. Um, Israel, any thoughts on the, the people side? Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's interesting. And this is some, I, something I am um, and a point I talk about a lot is that although it's not typically seen as such, nonprofits are actually businesses, although they have different goals from their for profit uh, brothers and sister organizations, maximizing their charitable impact versus um, enriching shareholders. They have to meet their goals given limited resources, compete with other causes for donor dollars, um, and really attract and retain top talent to contribute to the success of the organization. Um, that's the most unique resource that an organization has. And to achieve the most impact, it's critical that nonprofits are able to retain the best talented people in order to help them succeed. Um, to, to start with, it's important to look at what's inside the organization. Obviously, like we said, these are the resources you have. Um, take a look at what skills do we have? Um, are there any gaps within those skills? By actually looking internally and identifying um, where you have an opportunity either to grow or to add skills to the organization that are needed to succeed in the future, um, whether through internal professional development or through hiring in, you'll be much more able to adapt as the world around you continues to change because you will have these talented people who are able to stay at the forefront of that and help the organization grow and adapt in those environments. Um, another important consideration, and Karen was talking about this earlier, um, when talking about donors releasing the restrictions on, um, on their donations, it's really important because your organization stakeholders naturally feel that every program has value, um, whether that be the people who work for you, whether that be the donors who gave money and restricted it to a specific purpose. Um, but as we've seen during a pandemic and during global crises, priorities sh can actually shift dramatically and not all programs are gonna retain their value or deliver a similar impact or the impact they've traditionally been delivering as you move forward. So it's important to keep stakeholders a part of this process so that we make sure that you continue to have buy-in to the organization. I think to Eddie's point, it's, it's really important and critical that organizations become diverse and beneficial to them because they will be reaching a diverse set of donors if they represent a diverse organization. Um, so I think those steps are really critical as part of the overall organization growth um, to really take a step back and look at its foundation. And as I said, its most unique resource, its people. And Cleanser, you um, touched on the fact that after the, the oil spill, um, how much the people kind of came together and really saw the benefits of, of not-for-profits. Um, how do you think, you know, they can capitalize on, on that in the, in the future? Yeah, I think it has aroused uh, public uh, or donors or, you know, the whole community has been aware of the importance, right, of uh, people, mm -hmm. right, of working behind the scene. And for me, uh, uh, and when you talk about non-for-profit non uh, organization, it is before everything a people business. So we know very well that there are people, there are a lot of people right, who do the work on a voluntary basis. But as Karen was saying, now we have reached a point where not only we need the people down the line or on the ground to do the job, but the boardroom has to sit more oftenly, or even if it is virtual meeting, and we need to get leadership. There is a very important, uh, important. We have a lot of importance on leadership. 
because as we said earlier, uh, in these in this particular areas of challenges that we have, right? Board meetings, people inside, right? New talent to join in in order to bring new ideas and new initiative is more than ever needed. So it is time that also there is clear leadership about where we are going. And this is why there should be concentration on short term objectives, but without forgetting the long term objectives after that. And Karen, how um, did Global Impact uh, communicate with its people or how has the board um, and leadership reacted to, to the pandemic? So we've had uh, a lot more board interaction during the pandemic, uh, a number of special meetings called um, to work with the board to get their input to help uh, us and, and let the board know where where we've been able to pivot or make uh, some changes to support global impact at this time. So that's, that's certainly been beneficial. Uh, I think we can lean harder on some of our board members um, and I, we will continue to try to engage with more uh, conversations with them. But as, as the rest of the panel has also stated, this is about an investment in leadership and growing and building talent takes time and needs funding and nonprofits, especially for small and medium organizations, this is an extremely challenging funding stream to get from uh, donors who are restricting their funding. And the millennials in particular are extremely interested in growth and professional development. And for our, our nonprofits to be successful, we need to invest in them. One of the things we've done at Global Impact for our mid-level, managers in particular is identify a, a online platform that we're using to have monthly conversations around management topics and build that cross collaborative management structure so that we have leaders at all different levels building and growing together with the water cooler gone and some of the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that might have just happened in a casual conversation, it gets back to that deliberate and intentional communication that you're building within the organization. And I, I expect that to pay off in the long term because hopefully we'll be able to develop and grow talent anywhere around the world. That's one of uh, my silver linings from all of this. Yeah. And I suppose talent um, forms a bigger part of the, what not-for-profits need to um, focus on. And a larger system, as we, we touch on in this slide, is about the, the community. Um, Israel, how, how have you seen not-for-profits, um, you know, in order for them to reimagine um, and, and the focus more back on, on community? How, how, can they, how can they focus more on, on this to, to, be, to build back better? Absolutely. So it's, it's interesting because... Um... You know, in the non-for-profit world, I think it's unique where you have a situation where people paying for the services, so to speak, are not generally the same as the ones receiving them. And this creates sort of this muted market in which the groups involved don't necessarily understand or appreciate the needs and interests of one another. Now, facilitating and understanding um, and enhancing, really, understanding among these groups should be a priority for reimagining as a nonprofit, just because it's in a unique position to really understand both sides of the equation, right? Because they're speaking with the stakeholders, with the policymakers, and with the actual constituents in the community. So they really are in touch um, with what is needed. And it's a unique situation where in non-for-profits really seem to be the ones on the front lines and on the ground and really have the best understanding of what is needed and what is most critical in the marketplace, so to speak, but really in the world um, then and can really identify those most critical missions that need support. A good example of this that I've actually seen was um, there was an organization that provide, they provided uh, mental health and job training services. Um, so coming out of not this pandemic, but the most recent recession, uh, they did have budget constraints. And after taking stock of what their constituents most needed and really speaking with their community um, and looking at internally, like we spoke about before, what the organization could do best, they had decided that they would 
um, spend most of their time on their workforce development. And this was really an area that they saw as not being served by other organizations in the community. Um, and what had actually happened in the end was that this really had a demonstrable effect within the community um, and allowed this agency to address the need that would otherwise not be met while ensuring that the other programs that they had worked on um, were still getting covered. So again, I feel like not-for-profits are in, on a global basis, really in a unique position where they have the best understanding of both the donor side, so the funding side of things, as well as the actual needs of the community and are best positioned to really connect those two dots and ultimately make sure that they have an impactful mission that actually serves the needs of the communities in which they operate. Great. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I just want to um, move briefly on to technology because the obviously technology, um, remote working has been a, a big factor for all industries. Um, and interestingly enough, not-for-profits obviously had to shift to doing remote um, remote funding or, or virtual funding. Um, how in this new era can can not-for-profits you know, reimagine and take advantage of all of the technologies that are now available to them. Um, Cleansy, I'll, I'll come to you with um, with your thoughts. Uh, yes, I think uh, it is inevitable now, right? Whether we are for not for profit or for normal businesses, technology is the way forward. And in all cases, uh, I think uh, it is uh, it is attainable, right? Even for uh, NGOs, even for not for profit businesses, to think of doing business in a different way. Now, uh, as you said, right, even for raising funds today, we don't need to make face-to-face -face meeting. People are getting used, right, to Zoom meeting, to Teams meeting, right, where you can focus, you can showcase, right, what you are doing in terms of strategies. Apart from that, inside, also, even, even from the day-to-day -day work, right, less efforts can be spent in using IT resources. Now it is available, prices are going down, whether it is on AI applications, whether it is on bookkeeping, on any other things, right? Robotics is changing the world. I think that uh, uh, in terms of modeling, right? Uh, and the NFPs have to, to think about these also. And this is, this is available already and they can access these things. Now, coming on the ground, coming on the ground, uh, we see that uh, we talk about community idea. As I said, uh, when we talk of NFPs, it is essentially a people business. Even on the ground, right, going to community, right, doing the work on the ground, right, technology is doing its space, is doing its way, right? And as uh, Eddie was, was, was uh, uh, pointing out earlier, right, it is very important to think about that aspect of sustainability, right, to make things happen, but on a sustainable way, right? And I do think that technology has got its place, right, and people have to think about all the meals, the tools that have to be used in order to reduce resources and increase the level of, of efficiency. Karen, from a, a client perspective, how, how have you utilized um, technology or, or will be utilizing it to kind of move forward? The shift to digitizing our whole back office was swift. Um, it took a, a good amount of resources from our IT team and we're at a really good place and we still can do more and ha are working through some further uh, implementations, but it's, it's really forced us to rethink our processes um, and to build out uh, systems and, and our, train our staff so that they are able to function in this remote environment and that has just been a huge lift across the organization and i would suspect for all businesses it's really created a, a lot of uh time and effort from from all of our staff and and it just further demonstrates why nonprofits need more unrestricted funding to help them build better technology platforms. It's, it's a huge area that is underfunded that we see in most nonprofit organizations. And here we've got our nonprofits that we need to be the most impactful, to be the most efficient, and they have the fewest resources. 
to invest in people and technology. And so I, I just think that this is an area where our boards and our millennials who are already extremely competent in particular in a lot of this can be such a huge value add into mission-driven organizations that they care about. And Israel, from a um, technology, a cybersecurity point of view, um, Non, non for profits really do need to pay attention to you know digital with people working remotely that there there are potential issues that could be raised by um by you know utilizing technology and they need to be aware of them absolutely and i believe i read a study um by mckinsey that said something like we jumped um, five to seven years forward in terms of consumer and business digital adoption in about eight weeks time span at some point over the past year. Um, and to you know the points Karen was making and everyone else was making, that's great and will really help organizations uh, become more efficient, become more impactful. Um, but at the same time, we're probably at a point where cybersecurity is um, the biggest um concern that that's out there um and with this fast shift it's just important for organizations to also understand the risks that come with that and make sure that they're covering themselves on the back end that to make sure um all their information is secure um we're pro we're at a time again where we've never been able to be more efficient thanks to the technology but at the same time that does come with more risks so it's important that organizations um take the steps now to ensure that they can continue safely with these processes, whether that be through implementation of softwares or other strategies in conjunction with um, actually training their people on best practices um, and how to stay safe and protect the organization and its information. Um, so at the same time, while organizations are doing a great job of taking advantage of that technology and really need to in order to adapt and come back stronger than ever. It's just important to make sure you are protecting yourself because there has literally never been more risk when it comes to that area. And just moving ahead, um, in our survey of business leaders that we released in January this year, business leaders were talking about building back better is going to be the you know, the next big thing and climate change was going to be the uh, next big agenda that they would be focusing on. And obviously for not-for-profits, um, you know, how they deliver a sustainable um, impact um, is going to be crucial um, and how they demonstrate that. Um, Eddie, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you um, being our sustainability um, expert. Um, how do you see not-for-profits being uh, reimagining themselves with, with a sustainability focus? Oh, Eddie, you're, you're, um... you're muted. Yeah. All right, sorry. Could I, could, could I speak a little bit about technology before I move yeah, on? Yeah, sure. The... Oh. Early on, Easy mentioned about the contributors wanting to know how their contributions work and so on. With technology, you can actually think about using augmented reality technology for the contributors you actually have a real experience in seeing and feeling how the NFTs is, is impacting on the community on the ground, right? I mean, think about using technology, embracing it as an ally, as an enabler for new ways of working. So it's something to think about. Okay, let's talk about sustainability. Do we all know that there were 166 earthquakes over the past seven days? This of them happened today alone. I mean, there's a lot of things that's happening around us on the planet, et cetera. And the pandemic itself has really impacted on businesses and the economy too. And all these are having significant and costly effects on our communities and on our, on our health, personal and mental. To me, when we talk about sustainability, organizations and not-for-profits that are agile and able to adapt, they will be able to build resilience secure the future, and even grow against the competition. But if NFPs go one step further and demonstrate their proactiveness on issues relating to like United Nations, sustainability development goals, example, good health and well-being for all, inclusive and quality education, gender equality, and so on, if, if they start to think about these and have elements of UN SDGs in the picture, I believe it can deliver substantial impact for the charitable missions 
with greater support from governments and stakeholders, especially the younger generation, the millennials, etc. They are all wanting to go green. They want to make sure that we leave a better place for the future generation. And they will donate and support the cause if NFP shows that they are concerned about sustainability and climate and so on. Yeah, great. And I'm conscious of time because we are just um, reaching the top of the hour. Um, so I would just like to ask you all to um, like one final um, piece that we can leave our audience with and, and where do we go from here? Just what is the future reimagined? So um, Clenzie, I'll start with you. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, I would like to say at the Chelby International, we are very sensible uh, to this sector, right? And we have got experts in the in the different fields, and uh, and for non-profit for business, right? We are very sensible, and we wish really have to to put forward, right? The the support that is needed by uh, NGOs around the world, right? Because our experts are spread around, and uh, we believe in it. It is a people business. It is a big work which is being done by a not-for-profit, and of course uh, the new challenges are here and everybody has to go with it. So we have to remain positive about it and okay, look forward, right, uh, that they continue to grow positively and successfully. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, Israel. Absolutely. So yeah, I think I think what Clancy said is exactly right. Um, I think nonprofits and, and you know to what Karen said earlier, so focusing on that silver lining. I think there are a lot of silver linings for organizations here. I think this is you know obviously a challenging one, but an opportunity nonetheless for organizations to really take stock of themselves, um, focus on new initiatives or even legacy initiatives, how they can be done better, um, but really take the time now and use the opportunity to reimagine the organization um, so that it can really adapt and go forward successfully and really achieve what matters, that its impact and um, its focus and success on its charitable mission. Eddie, any final thoughts on the future reimagined? Yeah, just to summarize a few things, redefine your purpose, have clear focus, clear, clearly understood purpose. It's easier to communicate, draw in finances. Look into collaboration and socialization with corporations, similar charities, committees, and so on. Align your talent and skills mix to the new environment that we now operate in. Be open to embrace new technology and culture. Incorporate elements of diversity and inclusion. And finally, remember to go green and be sustainable going forward. Amazing. And Karen, any final thoughts? I would just encourage more collaboration inside, outside, all around, and to have try to get everybody to park their egos at the door and come to the table and really be willing to figure out how we can work together to get more impact in the long term. Great. Well, I haven't um, seen any questions come in and I'm, we're just coming up to the top of the hour. So if you do have any questions, then feel free to get in touch um, via the website. Um, and I would also say if you do have any more insights um, or looking for support for your not-for-profit business, visit um, www.hlb.global um, and we'll be happy to help and support you in um, any way forward. Um, and I would just like to thank all of our panelists for their time and their insights. It was a really great conversation um, and we look forward to helping you move forward um, in the new year. So thank you all very much. Um, and the recording of this webinar will also be available on the website um, for, future, for future reference. So thank you all for your time um, and have a good rest of the day for, um, for, for those, um, those who have been watching. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.